I find what I'm interested in in the doing. You know, I'm, I'm not good at the theoretical thinking about it, but I get into it, I get messy, I start doing it, and then I find what are the pieces of this that I am passionate about. If you have followed the rules but feel unsatisfied with where that's gotten you, this podcast is for you. We'll help you learn how to reach your goals through creativity, intuition, and flow. Welcome to the Flow into Authenticity podcast. We got three options for hellos for you today. This is our hello menu. If you need like a sexy calm voice, you can have Esther. If you need to hello. like get some get some energy in your life, you can have me go hello at you. Or you can have Jen sort of tentatively uh, sneak a hello in. <laughs> you want to do a tentative hello again, Jen? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I'm so excited to have Jen here today. Um, so Esther and I, Allison Henrich, we're here today with you with our good friend Jen Sorensen. Jen is a chemistry professor and a science educator who loves going to art museums, concerts, and she walks more than anyone else I know. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, she loves both thinking in kind of big picture ways, designing educational solutions to big problems, um, especially in science education, especially involving uh, girls and families in science education. And um, she also is amazing at details, planning, editing. Um, and so we're very excited to have Jen here with us today to bring a new perspective to our Flow into Authenticity podcast. So welcome, Jen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you both so much for having me. And uh, Allison, I, I appreciate you saying that I walk more than anybody you know. I mean, I think I'm <laughs> middle of the road walk-wise, but, uh, but it is something that I'm very fond of. Uh, middle of the road walk-wise? Your, your yeah. idea of like a fun Saturday would be like walking 20 miles around the city, I feel like. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all perspective. it's all perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, All wonderful. Right. Twenty, honestly, twenty is a bit optimistic. Ten okay. is very reasonable. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it's you're an inspiration. Yes. So everyone can be the judge of if ten miles it sounds like a pretty good, good length walk. Um. So Jen, I just told a little bit about your bio, but we would love for our listeners to get to know you. So. Can you tell us your story? What are you doing now? How did you get there? Uh, you know, you can start from your birth or you can start from uh, last week. <laughs> Where Whatever you want to tell us about yourself to help us get to know you, we want to hear it. It was a cold and snowy day. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm not literally going to start at my birth. Uh, I will. I'll start around the time that I graduated from college. I graduated from college uh, with a degree in chemistry, but with no particular idea of what I was going to do next. I was fortunate enough to have a research fellowship and uh, the lab that I was assigned to turned out to be a total bust. I did, however- uh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Say more. How was it a total bust? Okay. So I had written a proposal and I was um, 
living living abroad, I'd written this proposal that I was going to go work in a lab at a university in Budapest. And I had a professor who connected me with a professor there. And it just, it seemed fabulous. I walked in the door. Everybody was so welcoming. And the centerpiece instrument, like the instrument that the people in this laboratory do their work on, was out of order. Oh, no. For about six months. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) And I didn't have an unlimited amount of time to spend there during my fellowship. Um, So I found other mentors. I found another group to join. And it was it was amazing and life changing for all of the reasons that travel is life changing. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a whole other story. Um, Mm -hmm. But as I was in this fellowship, one of my mentors said, well, if this is what you want to do, you need a PhD. And so then I said, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm going to grad school. So I went to graduate school fully anticipating that I was going to work in the pharmaceutical industry because that was the job and and continues to be the job that a lot of people in my area um, I'm trained as a, a computational chemist. So I use computers to visualize molecules and to design molecules. Um, and now if you think about it in the context of Um, drug design, of designing medicines, of thinking about how does this um, medicine molecule, like a key, fit into the lock of the the proteins in our body. So that's what I thought I was going to do. But while I was in grad school, I fell in love with teaching. And Mm. that was the point when I decided, well, guess I'm going to pursue the academic career. Um, (laughs) I, I love say, that you were just able to switch like that. Like, yeah, oh. <laughs> we talk about that a lot. Allison and I talk a lot about our stories and listening to our intuition. And I also had kind of a surprise moment with teaching where I was like, what? I love teaching. I'm good at it. What? So like the fact that you're able to switch, like realize and listen to your intuition that you actually loved it and yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And you know, I I do sometimes think what would my career, what would my satisfaction have been like had I gone into industry? Yeah. And I think I would have enjoyed it, but I also think I would not have had nearly the number of opportunities for creativity and ownership in my work yes. and those are your values I, yeah those are you, some of your your core values probably yeah absolutely and so that really uh you know in in retrospect there are ways in which i feel like i didn't do my path correctly didn't do things <laughs> the right way Wait a minute, I'll, right according to who? Well, oh. <laughs> so Allison, as, as an academic, you'll understand that yeah. there is the, the correct, and I'm, I'm floating the air quotes right now, right? The, the <laughs> correct way to be a professor, to uh-huh. come into the profession and to rise through the ranks. And I have not done that. Mm-hmm. I have not done that. Um, in, in my field, it is very traditional and anticipated that after the PhD, you spend a couple of years as a postdoc, and then you apply for tenure track positions, and then, you know, you go off and be a a professor. Well, I finished my PhD. I was so in love with teaching that I just said, okay, well, I'm going to go start teaching. I also, I'll have to say maybe, um, there is no, there was no workshop in my uh, graduate program of like how to be a professor. Yeah. Oh yeah. There, there yeah. was no. Oh there yeah. Was no sort of mentoring or training yes. around. If this is what you want to do, 
how do you get there? <laughs> right. And so I made up my own path. Did you um, find I, any mentor? Like, did you go out and find your own mentors or you just like you Googled it how to be a professor? <laughs> well, you found your, you also found your own mentors when you were doing the. What did you call it? Not, <laughs> not my, my research fellowship. Research fellowship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So how, well, that's yeah. a whole other step. I feel like we keep interrupting you. <laughs> Oh, sorry, oh. Jen. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Not at That's all. That's a whole other say- subject, right? Of like how to find mentors and we really could. I I we really could have a, a whole conversation just on cultivating your mentors. Yeah. And, and, add, and really adding it to the list. Yeah. <laughs> And make let's make sure that that's mentors plural because yeah. um, just previewing that conversation, you you need a whole stable of yeah. mentors. We talk about that a lot too in this podcast. Okay, so just put a bookmark in the mentors, and then do you want to finish like your your um, story? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I decided to well, not decided, it happened because I didn't know that this was an intentional choice at the time. I did not do a postdoc. I did not apply for tenure track jobs. I just jumped right into a teaching position. Um, I've now been there for 23 years and I can talk about uh, a lot of the things that have happened in the span of that 23 years. I'll just really say that um, I have made my professional journey my own. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, within a couple of years of being in my teaching position, I stopped doing traditional chemistry research um, mm. because. I mean, it was, it was fine, but not really where I was finding fulfillment. Mm. Um, Yeah. One of the things that I did in grad school, once I decided, oh yes, I love teaching. I actually want to pursue an academic path is I started wandering down the street to the college of education and taking education courses. So as I was pursuing my PhD in chemistry, I was also at the same time pursuing a master's degree in science education. Oh, wow. Finding yeah. inspiration. Yeah. So Whatever. you did more than just wander down and knock on their doors. You actually got a degree in science education. Well, well, um, I took, I took all the coursework and, and my education advisor said, look, you're getting a PhD. That's all you need. So (laughs) don't bother pursuing an ed degree. But there was Um, something in you. There was something in you that was curious. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was where uh, my, my dual passions of chemistry and education were born. And that really has been um, something, you know, really great in the last 20 years that I've managed to weave those two things together in a Uh, way that I might not have been if I'd pursued the more traditional uh, academic route. So I love that because like, I think Allison and I can relate to that because we both have two kind of things that we love doing. And I think a lot of people that I talk to in coaching, they tell themselves like, oh, these things are, they maybe uh, don't fit together or they're contradictory, or this is like you said, this is not the traditional path. So was there anything when you were kind of like deciding to take these classes and pursue these two things simultaneously, which I love, which is like, kind of like we talk about the first step in the process of moving towards your dreams. Was there a part of you that was like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Like, what am I doing? Was there any part of you that was kind of, this isn't logical or why am I doing this? Or I should be doing something else or anything like that. Or were you pretty set in? I was, I was all in. 
Oh, good. Okay. That's awesome. (laughs) It made sense to me that if I was going to be in a university teaching people chemistry, that I should know something about the practice of teaching. Yeah. Isn't it crazy that that's not just a part of training for faculty? Like some yeah. faculty literally get zero training. In fact, that's probably the default is that they yeah. get yeah. zero training in how to teach. Well, I, yeah. somebody, I literally was like out of school for two, not even two years. And somebody asked me to teach and I was like, me, <laughs> why? <laughs> why don't I, I have no experience. And so, I mean, I was just an adjunct, but still it's, you know, it's kind of like doctors who don't get any training with, they only have like specific training. They don't get training with like how to work with patients or how to deal with trauma Mm -hmm. or how to like Mm -hmm. more things, you know, how to deal with the whole body or anything like that. It's kind of like a whole person. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Wow. So you were really, but you were really, um, you kind of, it sounds like you knew what you wanted, which is helpful. A lot of people, Mm -hmm. when they're, you know, on the path, they don't really know, they don't have a clear sense of where it is they're going, but so there's a lot of figuring out to do, but you kind of seemed like you figured it out when you were in that process and you were very clear sounded, sounds like. Mm -hmm. And that I've, I've found that over and over is that I find what I'm interested in, in the doing. Yes. So I'm, hmm. I'm not yes, good me at too. the theoretical thinking about it, but yes. I get into it. I get messy. I start doing it. And then I find what are yeah. the pieces of this that I am passionate about. Oh, I love that. that me yeah. too. The kinesthetic. Like, and I think so many times we think, oh, I should just, you know, I'm going to school. Like I should have a plan, right? I'm going to fulfill this formula. This is my, this is the plan and the thinking about it. But when you get in and you start to actually do it, it feels different. It oh, feels, yes. Right. And so you listening to that feeling and once you're in there is such a key. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I'm such a big believer in in undergraduates doing research. Um, mm. It's not that we're trying to train all of these students to become researchers. Our goal, partly, is to try and help them see whether or not they would enjoy yes. being researchers. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So and it's a having... success story, it, you know, for the students I've had who've done research and have said, oh, that's not for mm-hmm. me. That's a success story because they've learned something yes. important about themselves. That's the same with my um, coaching when I, you know, sometimes when people don't know what they want to do, it's like you go down these roads and you try things out. And I always get excited when my clients are like, I just don't want to do that. Or I don't, I don't like this part of that. I'm like, yay. (laughs) Or I don't want to do what I'm doing with have been doing, you know, that is a celebration. You know, Jen, when you're like, and actually I don't want to get into drug, you know, making, making drugs, (laughs) drug making, doing drugs or something. Yeah. Yeah. But like, it's that really, I love that point that that's a, that's a success when you, so many people get discouraged when they hit that point. Mm -hmm. But it's like, what do you love though? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that is such useful framing to, to think about identifying those data points of the, the pieces of the work that you don't love or the things that you don't want to do. Framing that as a success. Yes. Mm, because you're deepening yes. your self-knowledge. Yes. You're gaining clarity on what pathways you might want to explore. Absolutely. I'm getting all choked up, you guys. <laughs> I'm getting ver- the clumped. The clumped. <laughs> Give us a minute. <laughs> yeah, this is not coffee talk. Neither of you can drink coffee. You poor I did drink souls. coffee today. I did drink coffee because... Oh. I had a my really really bad migraine night last night. So, and Jen, yeah. you're not drinking coffee. I am really trying to 
be conservative about my coffee yeah. consumption. So <laughs> it's it's mostly decaf these days, but yeah. I do occasionally allow myself one cup of, of the real stuff. Mm, it's a treat. I do it on weekends. <laughs> Just a reminder that I'm a career transition coach, and if you're in a place in your life where you are feeling like something needs to change, feeling like you need to grow and expand out of where you are now but don't know how to get there, um, I have a few open spots for for six-month coaching, and I can help you to find your next steps by using your intuition and connecting to yourself and your inner voice. So go ahead over to flowintoauthenticity.com if you are interested in having a free 20-minute connection call with me to see if it might be a good fit or how I can help you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you really enjoyed this show. So... I'm pulling us back, ladies. Um, So we have talked about a lot of the parts of the flow method. So to recap, the flow method is finding inspiration, letting go of assumptions, opening up to possibilities and working it. So Jen's story is kind of a perfect illustration of how this works. Like you were in grad school, you got some teaching experience, you loved it, and that gave you inspiration. You had to let go of that assumption that you were going to go work in pharmacology for, you know, some pharmaceutical company. You had to open up to the possibilities of what types of academic jobs would allow you to teach. And then you've been working it for like the last 23 (laughs) years. Um. But I also happen to know that you don't just come to work and teach your classes and that's, you know, the beginning and end of your contributions. You do a lot of extra stuff like writing grants and running big programs and working with collaborators on other campuses um, in science education. And so um, can you tell another story of how maybe you're, your career has taken a, a turn that you maybe didn't expect or um, another type of inspiration that's come along for you? Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, one of the ways that I find inspiration in my life is through volunteering. And oh. shortly, and, and sometimes it's professional volunteering, and sometimes it's for purely personal uh, endeavors. So shortly after I started my position, uh, one of my work friends said, hey, we have this program on campus called Expanding Your Horizons. And so some of you out there, uh, hopefully you know about Expanding Your Horizons. It's a national organization that hosts Um, day-long workshops for middle school and high school youth, predominantly girls. Um, And the way that this looked on our campus is that we would have this day-long event with 40 to 45 different workshops in science and math and engineering. Um, All of our workshops were facilitated by professional women in their fields. And so it was a lot of opportunity for um, inspiring middle school. And our our program was specifically for, for middle schoolers, for inspiring middle school girls to see these are the kinds of um, career opportunities that are possible. And, and here are women, right? Real life role models that are doing it. And So I was on the organizing committee for that program. And over the span of about 13, 14 years that I did it, um, I mean, I had had every job on the committee you could think of, anything from being the refreshments coordinator to being the conference chair. 
So because I became deeply involved in that, that really expanded my professional network and a good... Did it expand your horizons, Jen? <laughs> oh, <laughs> but <ba-dum-bum. laughs> In ways that you cannot even imagine. So one of the women that I got to know through EYH, Expanding Your Horizons, um, she is pretty much... Uh, like her goal, her deal is networking for women in STEM and women uh, promoting girls and women in STEM education. Mm. And so she said to me, okay, so you are interested in science education. You're interested in girls issues. I'm going to do a little bit of professional matchmaking and connect you with Girl Scouts of Western Washington, our our local Girl Scouts Council. And so I got together with a couple of the staffers at Girl Scouts of Western Washington. We dreamed up some possibilities of what what would it look like to expand science capacity in uh, in Girl Scouts. We wrote a grant proposal to the National Science Foundation. Um, it was almost a million dollars. It was funded. We did the work. It, w- it was life changing because then all of a sudden I had not just my interest in science education I, uh, and, and girls and volunteering. I mean, I had this project that I was now a director on that was able to weave all of those interests together. Uh, I had a a close collaborator. She was my partner in crime. She's a dear friend now. I I mean, she was a perfect stranger to me when we first started, but 15 years later, she's a dear friend. And that was one of the projects that really got me thinking about What does scholarship look like for me in my professional life if I am not going to be in a chemistry lab? Mm. And Uh, that, uh, uh. you know, ever, ever since then, I have been involved in scholarly projects, my research, my grant writing. All of those projects have that component of education, whether it is uh, a focus on bringing science education into a community space like we did with Girl Scouts, or bringing uh, new ways of thinking about training science teachers. So working with um, future K-12 science teachers. That has been um, really where my my professional creative work has been um, in the last, yeah, yeah, the last 15 years or so. Um, and all of that work really is done with collaborators. Much of it is done with collaborators from outside the university. Uh, so Allison alluded earlier to the fact that I, I work with people from different institutions. I'm part of a a statewide consortium of science teacher educators. So the professors who teach Uh, the future teachers. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So that's, those are, those are my people. Wow. (laughs) I love, oh my gosh. Thanks for sharing that. There's a couple things that really stood out to me. It's like bringing back that mentorship aspect of why um, finding a mentor or sometimes we call them expanders is important. Like you, you know, have expanding maybe the, uh, the minds, I guess, because we can only kind of see the possibilities of what we've seen before. So you kind of bringing in that expansion and mentorship to younger girls and also to teachers, right? And then the other thing that I thought about was your values again. So like, did you know that like this sort of connection or, you know, really teaching was one of your values or, you know, really training or 
bringing people together was one of your values. So those are the kind of the two things that stood out to me in that, in that, in you, your sharing. Um, so I don't know if, if you want to. Yeah. So the community piece. So you mentioned mm. community several times. Did you realize that having a community was important for you? No. <laughs> is it mm-hmm. important for you? It sounds like it is, but maybe we're overstating it. It is. It is. And I mean, I think some of this is simply the the power of the collective, that we are able to achieve more in community than we are as individuals many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I there, there's a lot of a lot of what I engage in is bigger picture kind of systems thinking. Mm-hmm. Some of these are problems that one person cannot solve alone. Right. It mm-hmm. needs to be done. Uh, with multiple perspectives from multiple either areas of expertise or different institutions, you know. So I'm I'm really a a huge huge fan of working in collaboration with others. Yeah, I love that. It's like, and this is what I find when I'm coaching people too is a lot of times it comes back to community and connection it's like you have a passion for something but also like it's our gifts are just a piece of the whole right and it's our gifts when we really tap into like what we're passionate about what we're excited about it actually is a gift for the whole for the community for the greater Mm -hmm. good for the Mm -hmm. growth of you know our culture and so I think that's so beautiful, your story, because you just kind of like following this, these breadcrumbs, these things that excite you and lead, that are leading you to um, really supporting so many people and giving. I mean, I think a lot of times when we talk about this stuff, people are like, well, why should I do work to figure out all this stuff for myself? Isn't it selfish, you know, mm-hmm. to go and try to just figure out what I'm passionate about, figure out what I'm excited about. Isn't that selfish? But really like your story is so exciting to me because I think eventually that's really what happens for a lot of us is we find what we're excited about and then it leads to the gifts for the greater community. So I love Mm. that so much. Mm. Not that you planned it like that, but like (laughs) it just happened. And I think that's what happened. I I had, if if you had, if you had asked, um, if, oh, honestly, so here's the funny thing. And this, I, I, this just occurred to me as, as you were talking, if you had asked 16 year old Jen, what she was going to do professionally, (laughs) Um, she was going to get a degree in sociology or social work and work in a community center. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that yeah. funny? I know. Wow. It's so funny yeah. how it So it it yep. all, like full circle. It, it all it all comes back around. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I love that point, Esther. I just think it's so important to um, make people aware if they're not already aware that you doing things for yourself that feel selfish ends up putting you in a position to, uh, really positively impact other people and just the impact of all your work through working with, you know, girls directly and working with all these teachers who have worked with so many countless students over the years, I mean, just the impact of that, um, of what you've put out into the world has to be absolutely huge. So, um, yeah. And, and just, you know, like whether you're a parent or a friend or a teacher, you being passionate, so passionate about what you do, you give other people permission. You give your kids, you give those students or the people, the junior hires, you know, the Girl Scouts, you give them permission. Like they can see the passion in you and they could be like, I could do that or I could do (laughs) not that. I could do whatever I want, right? And just, it's such a beautiful thing when we tap into that excitement within ourselves because we give, we literally give people permission. I think it's especially important for women. 
mm. to give young women permission. Mm-hmm. I, you know, as we've been talking today, I've primarily been talking about my, my what I'll call for now my external work. I haven't really even been talking about so much uh, my my core the core of my day job, which is teaching. But that is one thing that I hear over and over again on my evaluations is, I, I mean, it's it's the dumb stuff about, you know, just how enthusiastic and how much I love chemistry. And <laughs> I think my enthusiasm is infectious to my students, um, some of whom you know, they're most of them, let's be honest, most of them are not going to be professional chemists. Um, (laughs) But, but hopefully they have an appreciation for the beauty of chemistry. Because, because I I try to, I try to bring that. Mm, That's so wonderful. Well, I'm also a big cheese ball. And you, just like Allison, I love talking about like how you're so creative. You, you, I think you had teacher training in yoga. You always go to a million concerts all the time, travel, you know, like you have so many different passions and I'm sure that they all infuse into your, what we call your essence, right? Like it's a part of like your core creative essence, who this person is who you are. And so we always ask people to what, like if you had to describe this essence that your students get so excited about, or, you know, just we, why we love hanging out with you or who you are at your core, like, is there a way that you would just, I know it's a tough question, but is there a way that you would describe it? It could be funny or it could be logical or it could be whatever you want it to be my my core essence this is a hard your, question or your <laughs> gift your gift to the world like how you see like where I was talking about you know how you mm-hmm. what you see your gift to the world or your community as or your students yeah yeah I I'll tell you this through another short anecdote. Uh, When I was a senior in high school, I was captain of my tennis team. Now, this is not because I was the best tennis player, far from it. I was, however, uh, the girl who sang chants as we were running laps around (laughs) the court. And apparently, uh, our coach thought, okay, yeah, that's... uh, we're, we're going to make her one of the co-captains. And then the other co-captain was just a fabulous, fabulous tennis player. Oh, so I, I think, that. and and that really speaks to something that, you know, even now I, I see where there are things that need addressing in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Things that need improving, things that need solutions. And I'm going to be the one to round everybody up. I'm, I'm going to be the cheerleader. I'm going to be the organizer. I'm going to be the motivator. I'm going to be the, the person who puts the wheels in motion. Mm, that is so oh, amazing. I'm tearing up again. I know. <laughs> so beautiful. Because yeah. we're all so unique, you know? I mean, who would have thought like a scientist cheerleader <laughs> I love that. I love it so much. I mean, I was also like not not just the cheerleader of my tennis team. I was also for two years a a cheerleader. You were me what? too. Oh, yeah, for one year. I'll, I'll show you the picture sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Wait for what sport? Football. Football. Mm. Oh, I can see that with your with your gorgeous long flowing hair and your your energy and enthusiasm. I can totally see that. Yes, yes. Um, It is also the case, though, that at the time, you know, I was what thirteen years old, and I was not particularly a football fan. Let Let's be honest, I was not a football fan at all. I was just, as a kid, um, really loved the idea of being a cheerleader. So, I mean, I did these chants 
first and 10, do it again. I yeah. had no idea what I was chanting. Same. <laughs> Me too. Same. Me too. Were you a cheerleader, Allison? Yes, I was. You were all cheerleaders? <laughs> sure. Whoa. That's this why we crazy. get along so well. Oh Cheerleader educator. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I knew nothing about football either. Yeah. First and 10, do it again. I still don't know what that means. Be aggressive. I, I also don't know. Is it first <laughs> in 10 or first and 10? I can't even answer that question. I just sort of. The only reason I became a cheerleader, (laughs) I really, I really didn't want to become a cheerleader, but I moved when I was 15 from Los Angeles to Iowa. And I really wanted to be in the dance squad because in LA, there was like this awesome dance squad. Mm. So the only thing that was similar was like cheerleading in Iowa it was not the same <laughs> at all. As, as dance squad in LA. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, but that's, yeah. well, that's great. Uh, all of us are cheerleaders. Well, yep. there you go. Be who aggressive. Would, who would think it to look at us now? Oh, right. Never. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> totally makes sense to me. hundred percent. Well, Jen, do you have any any more beautiful stories to share with us or any last questions or thoughts before we wrap up today? Or what would you tell people who maybe are on this journey trying to figure out, you know, what they're passionate about, what their gifts are? Mm, great. So, as I mentioned before, a lot of my um, inspiration and my gift finding has come through volunteering. And that, I think, is something that I, I would encourage other people to look for opportunities as your time and your capacity allow right? Even if it's in very small ways, look for opportunities to get involved in some sort of a community endeavor. It doesn't have to be anything that even seems connected specifically to your current professional uh, work or to something that you're thinking about in the future. I mean, just what what gets you excited? Mm -hmm. What are the things that you enjoy? Do a little bit of exploring and you're never quite sure where it might lead you. Yeah, that is great advice. Yeah. Follow your curiosity. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This was really amazing. Hey, and maybe that can be part of the 4% actually. So yeah. this we, could be, yeah. so every, every episode we have a 4% challenge. It's kind of like our little homework assignment for listeners. So what is something that you could volunteer for or go out and experience to get some, you know, on the ground understanding of what it would be like to do a certain kind of activity? Yeah. Um, I think that's. Yeah, that's fabulous advice for our listeners. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself that if you're in, if you have the capacity now, or if you're trying to, you know, if you're in a place where you're, um, you don't know what the future holds, you know, well, thank you both. This has been so great to hang out and hear your story, Jen. Thank you both so much really for, for hearing my story and for affirming um, some of what just felt like was, you know, totally stumbling down the road, but ultimately has, has kind of turned into a a pretty interesting life. Oh, I love it. It's so beautiful. (laughs) We're we're all stumbling. We're all stumbling. I think you have the makings of your title for your autobiography somewhere in there. <laughs> mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank All you. Hold right. On to All right, dear listeners. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And we're out. You've been listening to the Flow into Authenticity podcast with your hosts. 
Esther Loopstra, Jen Sorensen, and me, Allison Henrich. Our original theme music is by James Wetzel, and James Wetzel also does sound editing. If you like what you've heard today, we hope that you will subscribe, like, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. 